We have with us Mr. Uh, Mr. Rob Lloyd, uh, CEO of Virgin Hyperloop One. Rob, welcome to India and thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Point. It's my pleasure. Are you going to sign an MOU today for uh, Hyperloop connectivity between Mumbai and Pune. Can you just give us some more features of that connectivity? Yeah. Well, first of all, we're extremely excited to be able to uh, sign uh, a framework agreement that would lay out the steps required to build the world's first Hyperloop uh, right here in the state of Maharashtra, connecting Pune uh, to Mumbai uh, and hopefully uh, carrying uh, millions of passengers a year. You know, uh, you have been uh, working on the Hyperloop technology for roughly around four years now. Uh, can you give us an idea of uh, when do we as Indians or Mumbaikers will be able to get the Hyperloop in Mumbai, Pune? Well, last year, historically, we've demonstrated for the first time in the world an actual operational Hyperloop. We did that uh, at our test and development site just north of Las Vegas. And that was a big moment for us, having taken all the brilliant minds and engineers that are working on this technology and prove that it works. So hmm. that's done. And obviously then the next part of our company's focus was to find a route uh, and a government that wanted to demonstrate that capability and then put it into production. Uh, obviously we think we've found tremendous support here locally, not only in Pune and Mumbai, but as well as in the state and at the federal level. Um, and I'll lay out the time frame for you. In the next six months, we're gonna do a detailed engineering study, having already completed a successful pre-feasibility study. Uh, this feasibility study will look at environmental impact, detailed costs, station locations, economic benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, expecting that that will be acceptable, then we'll describe the formation of a public-private partnership, the funding of that project, and begin the first of the uh, parts of that route along the corridor, and then that could occur by 2021. So the government will have a stake in the Hyperloop? company which will be no this will be a public private partnership the formation of that the funding of that will be determined at the end of this next phase of the feasibility study so we expect to have the answer to that question in six months but the entire framework agreement that we have signed takes us all the way out through the six-month study through the procurement vehicle through the construction of, a, of, of the uh, of the test and demonstration part hmm. and then the full 140 a kilometer corridor. Hmm. And I un understand that it's going to be operational in in six to seven years is, is the timeline which you have because in three years you're going to start the test and in another three years you're going to put up the entire operational facility so that the Hyperloop would be operational in six to seven years. for Correct, people. the full route, the full 440 route. kilometers. kilometers. But the, the, uh, the uh, next three years we'll see the, the completion of, a, of this uh, first demonstration part of that then we need to work with the regulators to certify the technology and make sure that safety requirements and all the things that both you and I mm. would expect are in place. Mm. That then will, will, will happen concurrently with the construction of the full 140 kilometer route. All of that is expected to happen in six to seven years and the demonstration route in the next three. You know, it's a big uh, in infra project from any standards in India. And uh, Hyperloop uh, itself has raised, what, $250 million in the last few years. Uh, I'm assuming that you have to raise more funds for this project because in, if, if everything goes on, rec on time, India would be the first country to have a Hyperloop connectivity between two cities. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, what is the fundraising you would need uh, from India and how would you do it? Yeah. Are you looking at private investors in uh, or is it going to be only debt and where does the government's role come in here? So this project would be independently funded. Uh, this project would have our involvement, but as well we expect to have many important partners in India and elsewhere that actually can see the economic returns on this project. It is one of the best economic returns we've analyzed amongst the dozens and dozens of routes around the world. So mm -hmm. we're very convinced that private investors, Indian investors, as well as international investors will be very intrigued with this project and will join us in forming that public-private uh, uh, funding for it and then along with the government who have been so helpful giving us their resources, their time, providing us with a, a right of way that does not require us to go and acquire other land but follows generally uh, the, uh, the current uh, road corridor. Which is the Pune-Mumbai Express Corridor. Correct. So that, that w because we're a very small footprint, uh, we require much less land than other modes of transport, for example, like high-speed rail where you need a very large amount of land and typically you need to move people from their businesses or houses. We won't need to do that uh, in this case, so therefore construction can happen more quickly, the costs are lower, 
Uh, we make much less impact on disruption of people's lives. We have an all-electric green technology. It makes no noise. I think we're, we're obviously very excited because it has so many benefits for the citizens in Maharashtra and those that would choose to live and work anywhere between Pune and Mumbai. What about root economics here? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit of root economics? How feasible it will be for you to break even at the earliest and what kind of costs involved a, a ballpark cost which would be there for developing construct, construction, manufacturing facility, everything which you have to put in here. Yeah, so the root economics first and foremost probably always start with the fare, with the, uh, with the revenues from yes. the project. This project will have two revenues. One is from passengers and the other is potentially from on-demand cargo. You know that 25% of the cargo that comes into the port in Mumbai goes directly to Pune. So when you think of this on-demand world we live in today where you expect to order something and get it tomorrow, obviously anytime you can make that experience quicker for high value goods, for your newest phone or your uh, merchandise, that's going to be part of the revenue. We, we think that the revenue case uh, for the Pune to Mumbai route, also connecting to the new Navi Mumbai airport, will be one of the highest revenue potential in the world because we're serving pr pretty much 26 million people in this mega region. Secondly, cost to construct. Um, we will be building manufacturing processes here in India that will effectively automate the process of constructing this. This can happen much more quickly than other modes of transport like a road or a rail line because we can elevate and come off the ground, we can dig a tunnel and go under the ground to level the grade. So we'll be building those manufacturing capabilities very consistent with the government's Make in India policies. I think that's one of the reasons why this is so exciting. We can manufacture here, we could create uh, vehicles here, we can create methodologies here, we can tap into the brilliant engineering minds that I've seen before in my previous life at Cisco. And I think we'll create thousands of jobs in the next five years, tens of thousands of indirect jobs. And our estimate is over $50 billion of economic benefit for the region over the next 30 years. What about the fair economics here? I Means, how easy w would it be for a family of four uh, to reach uh, Pune from Mumbai and maybe 14 to 25 minutes, that's the estimate you've given. So we, were, we have modeled every part of the preliminary feasibility study, which was very well uh, accepted uh, by the regional uh, authorities in uh, Pune, uh, on the fact that this fare will be a substitute for, with existing modes of transport. This is intended to be a transportation system for everyone, not just for the rich. And that's the model we're using. So whatever other cost it is to travel, whether it's train or or driving or time and, and fuel, we're going to model an inexpensive ticket, deliver the benefits of taking a three to four hour uh, drive or a three hour train ride and reducing that somewhere between 14 and 25 minutes. And I think when that happens, it's been proven around the world, you get a very high uptake as long as the tickets are not priced only for a few. And we will price them so it'll be affordable for every family and every worker that wants to be able to work one place, live another, have friends and visit family, I think that's going to change people's lives and obviously we're very proud of that. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll ask you the last question here. You spoke about two modes of revenue streams here. One is a passenger revenue, one is a cargo revenue. Uh, when you're going to construct finally after the test is done, will it be two tracks or will it be a separate track for cargo and passengers or how does it... Same track, same vehicle. Just imagine sometimes when you see inside an airplane, we see an airplane and the airplane, the interior of the airplane was constructed for passengers. If you looked at a FedEx plane or a UPS plane or an Amazon plane, they're constructed for cargo. So the same vehicle, the same pods will be constructed. One will be optimized for light on-demand cargo and the other for a passenger experience. But it's the same vehicle, same track. Perhaps we'll carry in the, in the slower times, we'll carry uh, freight, but in the peak periods, we can move up to 10,000 passengers per hour in both directions and I think that's going to give us tremendous capacity. And that would be the break-even point for you as well, 10,000 passengers per hour, Ten, two way? Yeah, that's not the break-even point. Uh, the break-even point is much lower than oh, that. Okay. This, this, this point of 10,000 passengers per hour, a total route of 140 kilometers, the end points we've already identified in the preliminary report and we'll be then further defining in the detailed feasibility study. This is going to be perhaps one of the best economic cases we've seen. 
and that's why we're so very, very proud to be here. Thank you, Rob, and wish you all the best for Hyper Virgin Hyperloop. Thank you very Thank much. You.